Welcome to Sunday Worship at the First Unitarian Universalist Society of Burlington, Vermont. Today is May 9th, 2021, and in the U.S. it marks the celebration of Mother's Day. And our Muslim friends are observing the last days of Ramadan, a time of fasting and prayer. I am Melinda Lee, a member of our worship associate team. Unitarian Universalists come from many traditions and spiritual backgrounds. We share a commitment to build a world community based on justice, compassion, and respect for our planet, Mother Earth. We encourage each other in a search for meaning in our lives. Here in Burlington, we acknowledge that the land on which our buildings are located is the unceded territory of the Western Abnaki peoples. It has been their meeting place and place of exchange for hundreds of years. Today's service is the first ever online worship experience created by our two UU congregations, the first UU here in Burlington and the first UU church in Baltimore, Maryland. We are very grateful for all those in Baltimore who are making this possible, most especially the Reverend David Carl Olson who is a longtime friend and colleague of our developmental minister, Reverend Tricia Hart. Reverend Olson's ministry allows him to use his talents as a singer and actor, as well as his commitment to Unitarian Universalist and interfaith organizing for justice. He helped found congregation-based community organizations in Boston and Flint, Michigan, as well as Greater Baltimore. And we have one important announcement today. Please mark your calendars for next Sunday, May 16th at 5 p.m. for the Beyond These Walls musical review, where we will be raising funds to help our first UU society here connect with people everywhere. We will gather on Zoom for this special musical event featuring performances by first UU members and friends. Our goal is to raise $35,000 to cover all the costs of upgraded systems in our sanctuary so that we can live stream services and events from our meeting house. You will be able to contribute by texting via your Realm account or by calling in during the event. Special thanks to our own Stephen Rainville for organizing and to Thayer Newport for recording many of the performances as well as numerous talented musicians who are donating their talents to make this a wonderful show. One time only, please don't miss it. To learn more about our society and about other events that take place here, please go on to our website. Also, free, feel free to contact us directly because we would love to hear from you. And immediately after this May 9th Sunday service, you are welcome to join our online coffee hour, and you can find the Zoom link for that on our website. The Reverend Patricia Hart serves as the Developmental Senior Minister of the First Unitarian Universalist Society of Burlington, Vermont. This specialized ministry assesses the strength of the congregation and helps the congregation imagine and build towards a vibrant future. Her specialization grows out of Reverend Tricia's experience as a settled and interim parish minister at eight UU congregations in the past quarter century, and by her consulting with another two dozen around matters of congregational vitality and financial sustainability. It is our joy to welcome her once again to Baltimore as we welcome all of you. Come, come, whoever you are. Whatever your gender, whatever your age. Whatever your beliefs, whatever your skin color. Whatever your gifts, whomever you love. You are welcome here this morning. And shall we say together, all, all are, are welcome, welcome at, at the, the table. table.
At First Unitarian Church of Baltimore, we begin our service by taking a flame from this altar and carrying it into the chalice, the chalice into which we pour ourselves and which we believe will hold us, hold us as we're striving to build the beloved community, joys and sorrows. In Burlington, we kindle this chalice flame to remind ourselves of the light of truth, the warmth of community, the fire of commitment. And in Baltimore, we remind ourselves of the four aims of our mission statement, transforming spirits, cultivating diversity, supporting each other, and building a better Baltimore. The call to worship today is from the work of the Reverend Heather Janulis. She writes, we are here to practice and sustain our living tradition, to light a chalice claiming for justice the heat and power of fire. In our free faith, we are here seeking freedom from despair, the freedom to be loved as ourselves, and the freedom to grow beyond imagination. We are here, gathered in the name of all that is holy. Let us give thanks for the gift of gathering. Let us worship. I am so happy to be here with my friend and colleague, the Reverend David Carl Olson. David and I have known each other for decades since we sang together in college, college, and then, I don't know, a while later rediscovered each other at seminary. We have uh, never served in congregations right next to each other, but we've found ways over the years, haven't we, David, to share services anyway and um, including um, memorably uh, when I was, I think, the first guest preacher uh, at the First Unitarian Church of Baltimore in 2009 when David was your new called minister. David is uh, uh, not just a, a friend and colleague, he's also a resource for me. And when I have questions or concerns about about economic justice and about congregation-based community organizing and lots of other things, I go to David because I know that he will uh, not only be able to give me the, the, the history and the politics and the economics of the story, he will also be able to uh, connect it to the religious uh, life that we both share. And whenever I have a question about Mother Jones, uh -huh. David, is where I go. Trisha, thank you. Uh, Baltimore, I just want to introduce you to uh, Patricia Hart. Uh, Trisha is, uh, as she said, a dear friend. And beyond knowing each other in the kind of formal ways of pulpit exchanges and consultations and things, I treasure the time that Trisha and I've had in stuff around Unitarian Universalism, when we're at GA together and we go out and have a dinner, right? When we're at Star Island, sitting in a rocking chair and just talking about the world and talking about our lives. And Trisha is the person to whom I go when I have questions about congregational health, when I have questions about congregational growth, when I have questions about congregational finances. Um, and I know that I'm gonna be talking to an expert, but an expert who's gonna speak not just from the head, but from this heart that is the center of our life together as people of faith. So. Thank you, David. And I, I know that um, you're about to introduce one of your wonderful staff people. So I need to insert here a note of deep gratitude for all the staff and the many volunteers in both of our congregations that have allowed us uh, to do this uh, wild and crazy thing. Um, so thank you all. So this is the upside of this shutdown <laughs> that we get a chance to be with each other in these new ways. 
How exciting. By the way, I just want to say that the question I asked um, Tricia to address the first time that she was in the Channing pulpit um, was to talk about greatness in congregations and ministers. And what was wonderful was that she didn't say that one created the other. And at the beginning of our time together, that was a really important question. How can this congregation live up to the fullness um, of the hope of our ancestors and also the greatness of the need of the community in which we live. And what Tricia said was great ministers and great congregations form each other. And so my hope here in Baltimore, of course, but also uh, in Burlington, both as you're in this developmental period and as you go forward into the next stage of your life is that you'll have this eye toward partnering well with the person who's, uh, who you call um, so that you may together find the greatness that is Burlington and Unitarian Universalism. Great, David, thank you for that. A little improv, sorry about that, went, went off script. <laughs> but speaking of scripts, we are now going to hear from uh, Larissa Hurst, our children's religious educator here in Baltimore, who's going to share a story about Mother Jones. A quartet of singers stood before Mother Jones and she listened to their exuberance. Working men and working women, the end is now in sight. Take control of your own labor, that is labor's right. Beautiful, beautiful, Mother Jones said. That's the way I love to hear my children sing. Captured by the moment, a little girl jumped up onto the speaker's platform. Lisbeth, her mama whispered, embarrassed, ashamed. You get back here. Let her stay, Mother Jones replied. I have a special place in my heart for the children of this world. What did you have to say to me? Um, Lisbeth, is that right? The little girl lifted a tiny hand and a simple scarf of many shades of gray and brown. I wanted to give you this scarf I knitted, Mother Jones, for when you're out speaking to the men. Oh, beautiful, beautiful, you knitted this yourself and you're giving it to me? Oh dear child, thank you. And I wanna give you something. Good brings good. I want to tell you a story about when me and a lot of poor children went on a long journey. I took an army of children, just like you, to see the president. We walked for miles through the mill towns and mining towns that had crippled and maimed these children. And all along the way, I told folks, our children are being injured and killed in the name of American progress. And it ain't right. We marched right up to the company bosses with all the fat of the land in their bank accounts. And one of them looked at my hungry, hollow-eyed, listless little children and said, of such is the kingdom of heaven. And I said, if heaven is full of hungry little angel children, then I want to go to the other place with the bad little boys and girls and nobody said nothing. So I told them, there's a lot of empty cups inside these little ones' homes and their father's cups are empty inside their dusty lunch pails. Then I looked them straight in the eye and said, I've got a question for you. And the question is, who needs to drink the cup? Lisbeth knew she was hungry and thought she knew the answer to the question. But just then, her uncle James, who was always so quiet, stood up and spoke in front of everyone. I joined that march in St. Mary's mother. Then another voice, she couldn't quite catch who, said almost in a whisper, so did I. I walked right beside you, another said, and my brother died that month. And so my mother said I could go. 
We'll never forget that march. It was the hardest thing I ever did, but I was with you every step of the way. We remember that question you asked, someone said, who needs to drink the cup? And we're still asking it, who needs to drink the cup? Until we get the answer we want, we're gonna keep on asking it. Who needs to drink the cup? Yes, ask the question, my children, Mother Joan said. Ask the question. Lisbeth went back to her mama. She wondered what all this meant. She wished she could stay with Mother Jones, but she wanted her own mama too. As they walked hand in hand down the darkening lane, the excitement of the meeting stayed in her head and her heart. But in her imagination, there came a song. Who needs to drink the cup? Who needs to drink the cup? Those who live high at the top or those who mine in the dark way below. For need of it, 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 for need of it. Lisbeth held her mama's hand all the way home. For our joys and sorrows and all that is our life. For all our joys and sorrows, known and yet to be known, we come with hearts of thanksgiving. Grant us, Holy One, your peace, that we might remain as calm in our times of sorrows as we are in our times of joy. In every event in our lives, open our eyes, allow us to see the benevolent grace of your holiness. Help us to meet life's imposters as they greet us each day and treat them both the same. Enable us to say all is well, all is well, in whatsoever state we might find ourselves within our lives each and every day, continue to be with us and walk with us throughout this life. Amen, and so mote it be. As we let this music settle in, let us deepen into a time of meditation. We will begin by sharing the joys and sorrows of our community and then hold a brief time of silence. Let us hear these words of joy and sorrow for Sunday, May 9th, 2021. Rodney and Sarah are overjoyed to welcome Otis Christopher Russell Lowe into their family. And they should be on the flight to meet him in Tucson as this joy is being read during the service. Sorrow for the continued suffering in India, Brazil, and other areas of the world where COVID infections and deaths are high and oxygen, vaccines, and other medical equipment are scarce. Please send light, light love, and relief. May the joys and sorrows of each be the joys and sorrows of all, reminding us of our shared humanity. Amen and blessed be. Night falls soft 
town is a country folk and town. When old night steals in, you stop to think what might have been. A pretty dress that's worn, the friend you mother in the night and a father too they know all and they'll share if we're strong enough to bear they'll show us things by night to dark to see by day we learn things by night to help us on our way night's tall enough for mountains deep enough for grief but long enough It's true, there is a magazine called Mother Jones, but this service is not about that magazine, but about the remarkable woman in whose spirit the magazine was named. She was very real. Her name was Mary Harris Jones. And one reason she became known as Mother Jones was because she did act as a fiercely protective mother for the people she fought for, men who worked at important dangerous, not well-paid jobs, and their families. Women and children, often, who worked in textile mills. She went where working conditions were bad and where workers wanted to make things better, where a union could make a difference. Some called her a humanitarian, but according to her own self-description, mostly, she said, she was a hell-raiser. I decided, she said, to tell the truth wherever I pleased. She spent a good bit of time in the mining towns of Appalachia. Remember the song, She'll Be Coming Round the Mountain When She Comes? 
Well, there's pretty good evidence that that song referred to Mother Jones. Workers loved her, but not everybody did. When she was on trial for holding meetings with striking minors, the West Virginia district attorney pointed at her in the courtroom and said, there sits the most dangerous woman in America. She comes into a state where peace and prosperity reign. She crooks her finger and 20,000 contended men lay down their tools and walk out. There is very little truth in that story. It's a reminder, though, that stories are powerful and dangerous and good. Mary Harris Jones created the persona of the powerful, benevolent, fierce Mother Jones, whom working people loved and powerful people were terrified of. She was born in 1837 or thereabouts in County Cork, Ireland. Her family came to North America to escape the famine, first to Canada, where she trained as a dressmaker and a teacher. And then she moved to Chicago, and after that to Memphis, Tennessee, where she met and married George Jones, a skilled iron worker and staunch, staunch unionist. They had four children, and then tragedy. A yellow fever epidemic took her husband and all four of their children. She moved back to Chicago and opened a dressmaking shop, and that was when she began to see the unfairness of all around her. She saw poor people, jobless and hungry, walking alongside the frozen lakefront. And her customers included some of the city's wealthiest women. But her employers seemed neither to notice nor to care. And then tragedy again. She lost her business and everything in the Great Chicago Fire of 1871. So she began to travel across the country. And she got involved in workers' struggles in Kansas City and Washington, D.C., and Illinois and Alabama and Colorado. She lived all over Pennsylvania and West Virginia. She was banished from more towns, held in more jails in more states than any other union leader of her time. She supported white men. She supported black men. She supported their wives and families. Most of all, though, she said she worked for the children. Children who suffer when their parents work too many hours in unsafe conditions for too little pay. Children who suffer when they can't go to school and learn and play because they have to work. She wanted to draw attention about all the children who worked dangerous jobs in mills, but newspapers wouldn't cover it. There were stockholders of coal companies and mine owners who didn't want the negative publicity. So, she said, I've got stock in these little children and I'll arrange for a little publicity, which is why she organized a march. I didn't know much about Mother Jones until I lived in West Virginia for two and a half years. In West Virginia, where Mother Jones is regarded mostly as a saint and where children learn about her in school. This is a place where many people now and for years have been lamenting the end of coal mining. I didn't understand that at first, but the longer I lived in West Virginia, the more I came to hear that anger about disappearing mining jobs as, as deep frustration and fear and grief from people who were losing a job, yes, and income, and their communities, and also a sense of purpose and identity, the chance to provide for their families, to make enough money so their kids could go to college instead of going into the mines, so their children could have more choices than their parents did. The labor movement, the union movement in Appalachia and everywhere is not fundamentally about jobs. It's about people individuals and families and communities. Mother Jones once addressed a group of strikers. They had just left a church where the priest had preached that they should all return to work and that their reward would be in heaven. 
Mother Jones took the opportunity to address this same crowd in an open field after the service and reminded them that they were striking so that they and their families could get a bit of heaven here on earth before they died. I'm quite sure that Mother Jones would approve of the fact that this congregation every week in our offering, we share it. We give half of it away to organizations in the community that do the work that our principles and values tell us matters so much. This month, this Sunday and all the Sundays in May, the offering will be shared with the Vermont Racial Justice Alliance which is a black and people of color led statewide organization working in so many ways to dismantle the systemic origins of racism in Vermont. Your gifts to this morning's offering will now be so gratefully received. With gratitude, we dedicate these gifts in the service of our mission to inspire spiritual growth, to care for each other and our community, to seek truth, and to act for justice. Need me out. 
the working class of all God's children the best. Workers, you're my class, north, south, east, and west. I will be your best friend till they take me to my final rest. I was born in 1830, so they tell it. I died in 1930, and I say, to be born ain't the beginning, and to die ain't really the end. The struggle goes before winning, the straightest of roads has a bend. This mother was a rabble rouser, a hellcat organizer. I like whiskey and barroom talk, spent more nights in jail than out. They put this old mother behind bars to stop her cold. But they soon found out when old's not old. There's enough fight in this old girl to stop the boss's cold. I was born in 1830, so they tell it. I died in 1930, and I say, to be born ain't the beginning, and to die ain't really the end. The struggle goes before winning, the straightest of roads has a bend. To be born ain't the beginning, and to die ain't really the end. The struggle goes before winning, the straightest of roads has a bend. The straightest of roads, a word of confession, good for the soul, right? My life has seldom been on a very straight path. One of the great personal struggles I engaged in becoming an adult was coming to terms with the fact, or at least the assumption, that I would never be a parent. Despite coming from a large family with uh, five siblings and 17 first cousins, all living, well, within a half an hour of each other, despite parenting workshops for queer couples I attended, um, despite a series of conversations with lesbian friends about co-parenting, well, I became an adult when I accepted the fact that I would probably never be a dad. A therapist was helpful. She explained that children need all kinds of parents. She called them primary and secondary and tertiary parents. Every child needs them all. Primary parents are not only biological parents, but include the immediate kindred who take primary responsibility for raising the child, for providing for the child, and for helping them to learn that the world can be a safe and sustaining place. It may be the biological parents who are the primaries, but it also might be grandparents or aunties and uncles, could be foster parents or the partners of parents. Who knows, she asked. It may be that you will marry someone and become a dad. But remember, children need secondary parents too. Well, these are the parents who enter a child's life not in the family, but through public institutions in which the parents may have confidence. Every day, children are put into situations where someone is in loco parentis, a school, community organization, a church, might be filled with adults who become secondary parents. 
These are the teachers and choir directors and scout counselors and mentors, advisors, coaches. As I developed as an artist in residence in schools and community centers, as I directed the church Christmas pageant or the uh, conference center musical extravaganza, I became a secondary parent to hundreds of kids and even close to a few dozen. I sign my newsletter columns, the kids call me Rev, to remind myself that I'm not their friend, but their minister. And as their minister, I'm more like a secondary parent. My therapist argued that I should always remember that children need tertiary parents, those great iconic figures that none of us know personally, but whose story will inspire the children in the forming of their lives. Children understand the world a particular way when they can look up to their tertiary parents, the great icons of our story, like Harriet Tubman. She has a story that a child might understand little by little at age-appropriate levels, and as the child's life becomes more complex, they can understand the story in a richer and richer way. As the child's worldview grows to understand multidimensionality, then Harriet Tubman herself can grow from being the conductor on the Underground Railroad who leads friends and family out of slavery, who then becomes the woman with a pistol, who then becomes the union spy, who then the child can understand is the leader standing up against a cruel, inhuman, pervasively unjust system. Children need these great icons, and it is the primary parents and the secondary parents who introduce the children to the tertiary parent. I became an adult as I made peace with the ways I would be, for real, a secondary parent to many children. Okay. In a great experiment in sociocracy, I had the opportunity to spend a night in federal custody with my cellmate, Howard Zinn. We got to talking about, well, everything, as you do, but in a conversation about how history is taught, how, oh, I should say, Professor Zinn said that from the start we need to teach our kids the real story of this country. A people's history tells the truth about the invasion of this continent, the attempted genocide of the indigenous peoples and the theft of their lands. It shares truthfully the story of the capture of the peoples of Africa and their treacherous and often lethal middle passage and tells of their enslavement and uncompensated labor, the theft again of their labor power. But children need to know the stories of individual people, he argued. And rather than filling their heads with the stories of the founding fathers, we should first teach them about a kind of founding mother, an Irish immigrant of the 19th century, Mary Harris Jones, who called herself Mother Jones. Now, the adults in the room can hear some of the complexities of Mother Jones's story. But if we begin speaking to our children, we can share the heartache of a mother and wife who lived in a working class district in Memphis, Tennessee, when a yellow fever epidemic sweeps through that community and Mother Mary Harris Jones loses her children loses her husband. Not to be deterred, she takes her sewing skills to Chicago, Illinois, 
where she's employed by a few wealthy households. She gets to know their lives up close. But then Chicago burns to the ground. And while there will be work for those able to rebuild the city, it is there that Mary Harris decides again to recreate herself. She sees what is happening at the root of this so-called land of opportunity. She sees that those at the top of the golden age of politics, finance, and industry may wield their enormous power in ways that crush the great masses of working people. She commits herself to the life of a radical and meets others that are calling for liberation from wage slavery. She joins the Knights of Labor and she sews herself a costume wearing old timey clothes that she imagines workers might recognize as something their grandmothers might have worn. She begins to be known as Mother Jones. Now, when you read her autobiography, you'll hear outrageous stories of confrontations with the powers that be. When an injunction is issued against striking workers in Arno, Pennsylvania, Mother arranges for the wives of the striking miners to prevent the replacement workers, a.k.a. scabs, from entering the mines. A female mop brigade, she calls it, descended on the work site, waving mops and brooms, pots and pans, confusing the scabs and causing all the mules to flee. Such activity, of course, would land Mother Jones in court, where she was once told by a judge not to curse. Why judge? She said, that's just how working people pray. Do you pray that way, mother? Yes, I do, she said, when I want an answer quick. Life for miners and mill workers was dangerous and violent. Often the ruling classes would depend on the National Guard, or bands of paid militias to protect property and to prevent strikers from keeping others out of work until conditions are met. In one instance, Mother tells the story of walking up to a gunman and putting her hand over the muzzle of his gun. The gunman shouts, Take your hands off my gun, you hellcat! Young man, she says to him, my class goes down into the mines. They bring back the metal that makes this gun. This is my gun. You take your hands off my gun. The songs and story you've heard today were created by Little Flags Theater of Roxbury, Massachusetts. Maxine Klein and James Osterreich toured throughout Appalachia with their show, The Furies of Mother Jones, which argued that the work of Mother Jones continues today in the intersectional struggles of economic justice against subjugation by gender and for the unity of the multiracial, multiethnic, documented and undocumented working class. When I was in the core team of Little Flags, fellow actor David Jernigan shared with me his sense of the essential dynamics of the plays. On the one hand, there must be tremendous pride. Look, look, look all around you. All that is, all the beauty, all the marvels, where did they come from? either from God or from the labor of working people. Workers must be proud of all that we have accomplished. At the same time, that labor has resulted in massive wealth for the very few. 
the very few who own and who earn from their owning, not from their labor. All the pride workers should feel must be balanced by the anger that we must have at this systemic injustice. Pride and anger drives the drama and even drive the lives of people like Mother Jones. Mother Jones was clear about these contradictions in our culture and clear too about where some of these cultural contradictions come from. Once she was accused of being unladylike and she snorted back, I am a woman. It was God Almighty who made women. Rockefeller's band of thieves made ladies. I wonder who made all of the gender identity definitions that are somehow written into our heads and hearts when indeed God Almighty made a broad expression of humanity, made a broad expression of gender. Now earlier today, you may have seen words that were captured not in the bluster of Mother Jones's own writings, her inventions, but in a report taken down by a journalist and published as a, a verbatim witness to how she addressed her people. Has anyone ever told you, my children, about the lives you are living here so that you may understand how it is you pass your days on earth? Have you told each other about it and thought it over among yourselves so that you might imagine a brighter day and begin to bring it to pass? We come to church to tell each other our stories of the joy, perhaps, that Mother's Day may bring us, of the pain too, that we may know as mothers, as non-mothers, as the children of mothers, as the parents of the primary or secondary type. We come to church to express our pride when we experience awe and wonder in the lives that we are blessed to live. Pride and humility too. We come to know the beauty that is around us, beauty granted by God and beauty offered by human creativity. We tell each other about it. We talk it over among ourselves. We know that not all is well in this beautiful world. And I know, and we know, and I say, Mother Jones knows that we have the imagination to picture a brighter day, to picture a brighter day that our Unitarian Universalist faith and our Unitarian Universalist values and our Unitarian Universalist community all argue that we may be part of bringing about, yes, we may together imagine a brighter day. Yes, we may together begin to bring it to pass. May it ever be. Blessed be Ashe, Ashe. Peace, Salam, Shalom. Happy Mother's Day. I love you. Amen. All right, so now we're going to do a little bit of singing together. And in Zoom world, you always have to be sure that your 
muted yourself, and then you can sing with gusto and join the crowd, all right? Um, in folk music, of course, uh, it's not uncommon for people to know slightly different versions of things from one another, and we love it and learn to go with who's leading. And of course, when we sing this song, we're talking about taking steps forward on a march, and we know that some of us will be on wheels. Some of us will have walkers. Some will have canes. Some of us will crawl and toddle and walk and run. And all of us will move forward. The way we'll do this, I'm going to sing you a line, short line. You'll sing it right back to me. We'll do that a few times. Then we'll modulate up. I'll sing you a longer line. You sing the same thing right back to me. We'll do that a few times. We'll modulate up, and then we'll just sing the song with gusto. Step by step, the longest march can be won. Step by step, the longest march. Step by step, the longest march. Can be won. Can be won. Can be won. Can be won. Many stones can form an arch. Many stones can form an arch. Singly none. Singly none. Singly none. Singly none. And by union what we will can be accomplished still. And by union what we will can be accomplished still. Drops of water turn a mill. Drops of water turn a mill. Singly none, singly none. Singly none, singly none. Step by step the longest march can be won, can be won. Step by step the longest march can be won can be won. Many stones can form an arch, singly none, singly none. Many stones can form an arch, singly none, singly none. And by union what we will can be accomplished still. And by union, what we will can be accomplished still. Drops of water turn a mill, singly none, singly none. Drops of water turn a mill, singly none, singly none. Step by step, the longest march can be won can be won. Many stones can form an arch, singly none, singly none. And by union what we will can be accomplished still. Drops of water turn a mill, singly none, singly none. Drops, drops of water turn a mill, Singly none, singly none, singly, singly none, singly none, again, singly none, singly none. We extinguish this flame but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts and share with the world until we are together again. Our benediction today. So let us begin. Let us go forth in the strength of our joy and the power of our compassion and begin our lives again today. This is what we are made for, to love the world, to care for one another, to learn one more thing, and to let it change us. May our lives be our prayer 
until we gather again. Go in peace.